Hello, and welcome to Western Civ. Today's history ramble, the tale of the gun. Remember, these are rambles, so I run off of notes for these rather than scripted performances because I want to talk about something that's thematic rather than a chronological narrative history, which is obviously what we do in the normal thread. Well, the reason for this ramble is probably obvious. What happens is usually something happens in the media and it piques my fancy, or I see something online and think, well, that person is misstating history or that's not right. And of course, history is really important to me. It's probably really important to you. And I think a lot of where we are today is just a continuum of where we were in the past. And so it's important to get these things right. Well, if you're listening to this, you're probably aware that there was yet another uh, mass shooting in the United States in Uvalde, Texas, only a couple of hours from where I'm sitting right now. Now, immediately what you see are a lot of the same reactions. Demands for control, insistence that there can't be any gun control, and then inevitably people start to cite history or what they think is history to defend either position. Unfortunately, a lot of times what happens in these cases is people just get it wrong, sometimes intentionally, because they're being guarded by whatever end they want. You know, it's sort of like reverse engineering the scientific method, right? I want result X, so I'm just going to Jimmy rig the historical facts backwards until I end up with whatever X is. Or, you know, they're just parroting things that they've heard and those things were wrong and that happens a lot. So what I wanted to do was go back and take a look at the Second Amendment from a historical perspective. I'm not going to weigh in, by the way, at the end of this one way or another what I think should happen because... This isn't a politics podcast. There are, I don't know, one million of those. So you can go listen to any one of those that you want to. And nor am I educated in the realm of public policy. So I don't really think that I'm, you know, the right person to offer those suggestions anyway. I can hear what you're saying at home. I'm not a historian either. So why am I telling you about the history? Well, I'm not. But, you know, I'm an amateur historian and... As Dan Carlin always says, I can ask questions. And that's what I did in this case. And actually, to be honest with you, with this one, it's not even necessarily my question. It's everybody else's. And what I mean by that is that when I talk to my friends who live outside of the United States, when I travel abroad, one of the most common questions that I get is, what is up with you guys and the guns? And... Where does that come from? And so today I wanted to try to give a correct but concise answer to that question, which is, okay, what was going through the minds of the framers of the United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights? Because, of course, the Second Amendment's part of the Bill of Rights, which is just the first ten amendments for those of you keeping track at home. What was going through their mind and what historical problems were those Ten Amendments intended to address? And how can we interpret that going forward? And then also, how has it changed? It took me a little while. I wanted to get this out, you know, pretty quickly after the incident occurred, but it turned out a lot of the scholarship is actually a little dated And so I had to go back and make sure that I had all my sources correct and all my notes in order before I sat down and thought this thing out. Now, of course, what we're talking about here is the ratification of the Constitution of the United States of America. So the Constitution is remarkable, but, you know, it's still deeply flawed. It specifies, and this was intentional what the government could do, but it doesn't say what it can't do. 
And so I think the first important thing to understand about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights is that the Bill of Rights from the perspective of the Federalists. So you have the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. You think of key Federalists like Alexander Hamilton and, of course, James Madison, the father of the Constitution. They favor a strong centralized government. And then you have the Anti-Federalists. These are the guys who somehow you know, looked at the Articles of Confederation and said, yeah, I think this can still work, which is equivalent to someone looking at the Titanic after it hit the iceberg and saying, I think we're going to be fine here, guys. But there were prominent Anti-Federalists who had major concerns about what this government was going to be able to do. These are guys like Patrick Henry, John Marshall, so on and so forth. So th this is, we have kind of like two sides of the coin here. And the problem is you need three quarters of the 13 original colonies to ratify the Constitution. And in order for that to happen, certain states where anti-federalists are prevalent are not going to go along with it unless there is a Bill of Rights. So the absence of a Bill of Rights turns out to be an obstacle to the Constitution's ratification. And it actually took about four years for this all to come into place. The Federalists opposed including a Bill of Rights on the grounds that it was unnecessary. But the Anti-Federalists, who were afraid of a strong centralized government, refused to support the Constitution without one. And that comes back to what I think is the first key point, which is to get the Constitution sold, to get it passed, you needed a compromise that was going to appeal to the anti-federalists. So even though federalists, guys like James Madison, thought that it was unnecessary they tacked it on as a way of compromise. So that's our first key, right? Because what we start to think about is, all right, the Anti-Federalists wanted 10 things protected, so they must care about those 10 things. So what are the 10 things that they want protected, and what does that tell us about the goals of society at that time? So think of it like a sales pitch. The Federalists say, well, we've got this great new government. It's called the Constitution. Anti-Federalists say, no, 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 no. I don't like this. It um, doesn't protect my right to free speech and so on and so forth. And they say, oh, it's OK. Uh, you know, we, we only say what the government can do. You know, we don't have to list all the things that it can't do. And the Anti-Federalists say, not good enough. And so the Federalists say, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with this list. So this list will address the, the, the concerns that you have. So why don't you tell us what those concerns are, and we'll hammer it out. Now, Madison desperately wanted to get the Constitution ratified. And he made major concessions to see that happen. And one of the biggest concessions was the inclusion of the Bill of Rights. So right out the gate, we know, okay, this is a concession. This is something that addresses a specific concern that's very helpful to us, because if we can figure out what that concern was, we can start to unravel what the purpose of these amendments are. Now, recently freed from the despotic English monarchy, and this is going to be another big deal, this is going to be our second big thing, the American people wanted strong guarantees this new government's not going to trample upon newly won freedoms of speech, press, religion, you know, their right to be free of warrantless searches and seizures, so on and so on and so on and forth. Now, first of all, I think what we have to understand is that the Constitution is a historical document, and it addresses the concerns of the people at the time. Now, one of those concerns is addressed, searches and seizures. 
Let me give you an example. There were these things called writs of assistance. And these were just issued by the British Parliament. The British Parliament, by the way, that American colonists couldn't sit on and had no say-so in. Armed with one of these writs of assistance, fresh off the press from London, the British custom inspectors could enter your house, even if they had no evidence of a violation, and we're actually talking about Stamp Act violations, that certain documents had to have a stamp on them in order to be valid. But even if they didn't have evidence of that, if they had a writ of assistance, and by the way, these writs of assistance rarely specified exactly what house to go into. We're talking boilerplate here stuff, folks, where you just kind of fill in the address as you need it. So this let customs inspectors just ransack these people's homes looking for evidence of whatever they wanted. And so newly freed, the American people, formerly colonists, say, no, 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 no. We're not going to have this again. We want a specific guarantee that no one's coming into our house without specific cause. Hence, search and seizure. Let me give you another example. There is no better example that the Bill of Rights is a historical document that addresses concerns at the time than the Third Amendment. And you might be saying to yourself right now, well, I've heard of the First Amendment. I've heard of the Second Amendment. What the heck is the Third Amendment? The Third Amendment is, quote, No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Has that ever come up in American history? Not really. But it did in a big way leading up to the Revolutionary War. You see, Boston in particular found itself under essentially military occupation by the British in the years leading up to the Revolution. But the British were into, hmm, let's call it colonialism on the cheap. They weren't interested in spending a lot of money because then they were just going to have to recruit it from the colonists. And yeah, the problem right now is uh, the colonists don't want to pay for anything. So the British Parliament comes up with a solution. Okay, well, I don't want to build a fort for these soldiers. And, you know, we need to keep an eye on these colonists anyway, because we don't really know which one of them are dressing up like Native Americans and throwing tea into the harbor. So let's just, we'll just stick them in the houses. They can just shack up with whatever family, and that way they can also kind of keep eyes on the family. It'll work really well. Well, needless to say, the uh, colonists despised this policy. And so they wanted a specific protection that this policy of quartering soldiers in homes wasn't going to happen under this new government. Has it ever really happened since? No. Does it apply at all to the United States today? No. Has anybody litigated? No. But it was a big concern at the time and is evidence that the Constitution needs to be read as a historical document. Now, the other thing to understand about the Constitution in general is that there's two foundational principles, democracy and liberty. Democracy means that the people ought to be able to vote for public officials and then make most, underline most, decisions by majority rule. That contrasts with liberty. Liberty means that even in a democracy, individuals have rights that no majority should be able to take away. You know, Thomas Jefferson famously wrote in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of 
of happiness. Please, by the way, listen when I said Declaration of Independence. It's a huge pet peeve of mine when people consistently cite that as the Constitution, especially online. It's not. There is nothing in the Ten Amendments that give you life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's the Declaration of Independence. It's aspirational, folks. There's no way the government can give you the right to happiness. All right, so that gets us to where we are now. So let's let's look now at the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment reads, A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So at the time of the Constitutional Convention, everybody, and I mean Federalists and Anti-Federalists, thought that militias were a really good thing. Alexander Hamilton, writing in the Federalist Papers, called a well-regulated militia, quote, the most natural defense of a free country. His anti-federalist critics agreed. They thought there was a need for a citizen's militia. And they wrote that, quote, a well-regulated militia, composed of the yeomanry of the country, have ever been considered as the bulwark of a free people, end quote. So, both sides agree. We need militias. And in fact, one of the most important goals historically of the Second Amendment that it has completely failed to accomplish was to prevent the need for the United States to have a standing army. The people of the United States, circa 1791, hated standing armies. The Second and the Third Amendment, if you look at them together, work jointly to that effect. They're both intended in their own way to make it unnecessary for the United States to have a standing army. By the logic of the 18th century, any society with a professional army could never be truly free. They believed the men in charge of that army could order it to attack the citizens themselves, who, if they were unarmed and unorganized, would be unable to fight back. This is why a well-regulated militia was necessary to the security of a free state. To be secure, a society needed to be able to defend itself. To be free, it could not exist merely at the whim of a standing army and its generals. And here we can see the massive influence of classical history, and particularly Roman history, on the framers of the Constitution. Make no mistake about it. The framers of the United States absolutely adored classical Roman history. All it takes is a quick visit to Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian, and so on and so forth, to see the different ways in which the Founding Fathers modeled themselves after what they thought were the Republican Roman ideals. I'm talking men like Cicero, etc., etc. They looked at the great dictators of the Roman world, the Sullas, your Mariuses, your Julius Caesars, and what they saw every time was a man in charge of an army who decided he didn't like what the state was doing and was going to take it over. That was what they saw as one of society's most critical problems. To address it, they came up with the militia system. You know, we'll have militias, and that will obviate the need for a standing army, and therefore no one general will be able to use it against people of the United States. Now, in terms of defense, by the way, this didn't work. See the War of 1812. When the nation's capital in Washington was attacked by only 4,300 British troops In 1814, there were about 50,000 militiamen within a day's march. 
They outnumbered the British literally 10 to 1. And what occurred next, they say, is history. The majority of the militia didn't show up. Those who did were unarmed. And among those with firearms, they generally fled when fired upon by the British. The few thousand British marched unopposed into the capital and burned it down. So when you hear, though, the argument that the Second Amendment is necessary so that the citizens of the United States can defend themselves against, ostensibly, an American army that goes rogue, perhaps at the behest of a powerful general, that's true. That is part of the intention of the amendment. That was what the framers had in mind. That were their concerns. Now, of course, it didn't work. The United States has the largest standing army in the world at this time, and no amount of citizens with their rifles are going to defend against nuclear weapons, but that's not really a historical argument, so we don't need to go down the road. But it is worth noting that that was a concern of the framers at the time that the Constitution and the Bill Amendments were adopted. So the Second Amendment is about defense from a tyrannical government. That's part of the concern. But if we dig deeper into the historical record, what we find is that it's really about who should get the guns. In the end... Actually, the framers of the Constitution and the supporters of the Bill of Rights intended the Second Amendment to be restrictive. That is to say, the federal government is precluded from putting restrictions on who can own weapons if they are a part of the militia. These restrictions on militia membership are critically important to understand. Because despite the words of the Second Amendment, the 18th century laws definitely infringed on, and I'm putting quotations around this, Americans' right to bear arms. Specifically, many key signatories to the Constitution were really concerned about two groups getting their hands on weapons. Free African Americans and Native Americans. The idea was that the state governments and the federal government should be allowed to restrict these two groups from owning weapons. And the way that we protect everyone else is to put them in the militia. That is, the militia is supposed to carve out an exception so that only people in the militia, only people that can sign up for the militia, are allowed to have weapons. Laws at the time rarely allowed free blacks to have weapons. It was even rarer for African Americans living in slavery to be allowed them almost never. In slave states, militias inspected slave quarters and confiscated weapons that they found. There were also, by and large, laws against selling firearms to Native Americans, although these were more ambiguous. So in order to get the Constitution passed, Madison has to make a couple of concessions. He has to make a deal. Some of these concessions are famous. And a lot of them revolve around the institution of American chattel slavery. Of course, famously, the framers of the Constitution have to strike a deal about how to count representation in the new states. This becomes the three-fifths compromise. And there's also a huge part of this that revolves around guns. The restrictions that are placed on free African Americans to own weapons 
are no mere footnote to the gun politics of 18th century America. White Americans were armed so that they could maintain control over non-whites. Non-whites were disarmed so that they could not pose a threat to white control of American society. I think we have to remember that the idea of the slave rebellion, the slave revolt, is the great boogeyman of early American history. Even before Haiti and the horrifying atrocities that happen on that island, still, people living in slave areas and slave-based societies, they can look around and see how badly outnumbered they truly are. If those living in bondage get their hand on firearms, well, it's all over. And these restrictions, if you set them alongside the War of 1812, highlight a crucial point about militias. Militias in early America were way more effective as domestic police forces than they were on the battlefield against enemy nations. And they were most effective when they were policing the African-American population. During the 18th century, insurrectionary groups like the Carolina Regulators and vigilante groups like Pennsylvania's Paxton Boys showed that colonial governments couldn't just issue laws and count on people to obey them. And, of course, the American Revolution shows that, too. Shays Rebellion in 1787 and the Whiskey Rebellion in 1791 show that those problems don't go away when we have a constitution. Including all citizens in the militia and relying on the militia to enforce laws meant that issues that divided the citizenry could also divide your ability to enforce those laws. When disagreements over political issues turn violent, the government can't just enforce its will by force of arms. Because the balance of power over the citizen, who as militia members are both trained and armed, and they're the ones who are supposed to enforce it. So again, to kind of go back to the Roman Empire situation and the Roman Republic, the framers want to avoid a scenario wherein Caligula-like or Nero-like, the presidents of the United States can simply enforce their judgment because they have control of the military and the people don't. The concept of the militia was supposed to provide a citizen check on the power of government. Frankly, if you want to take it to its logical conclusion, the ultimate check on the power of government. Whether or not that's applicable today, again, I'll leave up. Now, the Paxton boys, for instance, murdered 20 Conestoga Indians who'd been living peacefully with their Pennsylvania neighbors for some time. So, again, these restrictions don't necessarily apply when they're used externally. And externally might not mean beyond the boundaries of the states. They might mean beyond the groups excluded from membership in the Union. And again, I'm talking historically here. I'm not talking about today. I don't want to go down that road and have that fight. Clearly, there were Native American groups in the 18th century who were considered outside of the United States. Clearly, and of course, Justice Tawney made this abundantly clear in the Dred Scott decision, there were a lot of Americans prior to the Civil War, and maybe beyond, who felt that African Americans could never be part of the United States of America. Read the decision if you're confused. Even though the government issued warrants, by the way, for those Paxton boys' arrest, and Benjamin Franklin himself called them a disgrace of their country, 
No Paxton boy was ever prosecuted. So the militias kind of form an early police force and are more often than not given a pass on what they do. So that's where things stand at the time that the amendment is adopted. We have militias, which are crucially important, but are intended to be a check on the government's power because because we don't want a standing army. And the flip side of that coin is militias are considered to be the key to the Second Amendment. That is, your right to bear arms isn't restricted if you're in the militia, whereas if you're outside the militia, so you're an African-American, you're an Indian-American, so on and so forth, you're not allowed to have guns, and that restriction is intentional. But I think there's another point to look at here, and that is, okay, who had guns at the time of the revolution? Because the argument that we get nowadays, and it, it comes back to a Supreme Court case that's fairly recent, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but the argument is, you know, every American sort of had a gun at the time of the revolution, and therefore it was necessary for self-defense and so on and so forth. So figures on this are all over the board. I read one report that said guns were listed in 54% of all estates in the late 18th century and early 19th century. And in fact, only 30% of estates listed any cash as an asset. So that means guns were much more prevalent than actual cash at that point. Of course, they, this only accounts for those Americans wealthy enough to bother making a will. And this number has to be said in some context. First of all, these guns were probably the property of the household. So if we assume that 54% of all households owned guns, that means we should discount the number by 50% for all the women who aren't counted. That being said, I read a couple of reports that talk about some female estates that do separately list a gun as an item of the estate. So I think a full 50% reduction is probably too much. And again, I shouldn't need to tell you this, but clearly enslaved individuals, free African Americans, and so on and so forth, didn't own weapons. And people living in bondage were a significant percentage of the population of Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia circa 1800. So much so, by the way, that Jefferson doesn't win the election of 1800 unless enslaved peoples are counted in the Three-Fifths Compromise. And we also have no idea how many of these guns actually worked. Many were probably antiques. Still, the suggestion that every person in colonial America owned a gun is probably flawed. Americans were, at the time of the Revolution, by and large, farmers and not hunters. Oregon Trail aside, the average American was not gunning down 10 buffalo or 6 bears for 700 pounds of meat and then you can only carry 50 back. They were tending to their farms, and the meat that colonial Americans ate was by and large from domesticated livestock. Moreover, the sources from the early American Revolution are chalked full of evidence that many Americans were not good marksmen at all. Some were, but not most, which belies the assumption that all Americans grew up with a gun. At the Battle of Lexington, only around a dozen of the men assembled to face the British had guns. The rest had pikes, or some form of ablated weapon. On the eve of the Revolution, Massachusetts had 21,549 guns, stockpiled for a province of 250,000 people. Nor, by the way, were guns 
used by individuals to enact like personal Rambo style vengeance against Native Americans as they were living on the frontier. The very reason that militias existed was to be able to outfit groups of men for state sanctioned acts of violence. We also have to keep in mind that, honestly, through the 1840s, there were hardly any gun-related murders in the United States. Most counties saw one, maybe, every four years. What this suggests is that, certainly, certainly, some colonial Americans and some Americans at the time of the adoption of the Bill of Rights owned weapons. Many more did not, and many more had those weapons housed by the state militias who were responsible for maintaining those weapons. Now what we need to do is take a look at where the Second Amendment goes from 1791 to the present day. For that, we have to walk our way through a couple of key Supreme Court decisions. And that will be right after this. All right, so we've established how the concept of the militia, at least at the time that the Second Amendment and the Bill of Rights was ratified, is crucial to our understanding of how gun ownership was supposed to work. Certainly, we can conclude that the Founding Fathers and drafters of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights believed that militias were a crucial part of democracy, in that they would prevent the population and forestall the creation of a standing army, a standing army which was anathema to those at the time who believed that if there was a standing army, there could be no democracy. We also know that thinking at the time was that militias were necessary in order to act as sort of domestic police forces. And therefore, the Second Amendment protected who could and who could not have restrictions on their ownership of firearms, i.e. anyone in the militia could not. What's really interesting about the Second Amendment is if, again, we kind of go back to the third is the whole quartering soldiers thing. The Second Amendment takes on a new life in the Supreme Court. And so for the second part of this ramble, I want to take a look at some of the crucial cases from the Supreme Court that has addressed the Second Amendment. Now, honestly, for nearly 100 years after the birth of the United States, the Supreme Court almost never dealt with issues related to the Second Amendment. Economics and questions of federalism were just much more important and would remain so until the second half, really, of the 20th century. Still, it's worth reviewing the most important Supreme Court cases to see how the Court's view of the Second Amendment has really dramatically changed, especially in the last 50 years. And for those who are not legal scholars listening to this, it's also important to remember that until the 14th Amendment is passed, a lot of the court decisions indicate that the Constitution is not applicable to state laws. And so until the Civil War is over, States can do what they want, and by and large, the court is going to rubber stamp that. The first case is United States versus Cruikshank, which actually comes to us from 1875. So in this problem, it's it's a really interesting case because there's a group of people who are responsible um, for what's called the Colfax Massacre in Louisiana. And... What's interesting about the case is that it it doesn't have anything necessarily to do with those defendants. Those defendants are suing 
under what's called the Enforcement Act of 1870 because they end up being deprived of their Second Amendment rights after the massacre and they're not allowed to have weapons anymore. And they argue that that is a violation of their Second Amendment rights. So the individuals who are being sued in this case are not actually the participants in the massacre, but the United States representatives who have taken away the right to bear arms. So the decision in this case highlights the problem that I talked about before. The court's going to rule that it's the responsibility of the state government to protect its citizens from other citizens. Because the massacre in this case took place solely within the state of Louisiana, the court ruled that the federal action, the Enforcement Act of 1870, could not apply because it was up to the state of Louisiana to handle the situation. And therefore, the individuals were actually allowed to have their weapons back. Now, the ruling acknowledges implicitly, though, that the Constitution doesn't give us the right to bear arms. It protects us from the federal Congress. This left states free to ignore the protections of the Bill of Rights and potentially restrict the rights of entire populations. This will actually remain the law of the land more or less for 135 years until it's finally overturned in McDonald versus the city of Chicago. In 1886, Presser versus Illinois is a more interesting case. So the, the lead plaintiff in the case is Hermann Presser, and he's leading a group of about 400 men who are brandishing guns and other weapons, including swords, in a military-style parade through the streets of Chicago. Presser and the men were part of a social club that supposedly trained people for the duties expected of them as citizens, including military practices. Unfortunately for them, it was illegal, and it still is, in Illinois, not only to form your own private army, but also to do any kind of military drills within the city without the permission of the governor. Presser argued that this infringed on the Second Amendment because he had the right to bear arms. The Supreme Court held, again, consistent with its previous ruling, that the Second Amendment applies only to the federal government and not the state government. Therefore, the state of Illinois was free to restrict the right to own and possess firearms as much as it wanted. But there's a small win here, because for the first time, the Supreme Court recognizes that there is a limit as to how far states can restrict gun ownership. States cannot ban the people from owning weapons, quote, so as to deprive the United States of their rightful resource for maintaining the public security. So we can kind of see the court here hearkening back to the idea that militias are essential for securing public stability, for acting as domestic police forces. And that's an interesting and important, I guess I'll call it vein, that runs through the system. From 1886, we have to go all the way to 1939 before we find another relevant legal decision. And that's the case of United States versus Miller. So now we are coming out of prohibition. And prohibition, for those of you I'm sure who are aware, is a time period in the United States when we see liquor sales be banned. What that results in is, of course, a massive market for illegal liquor sales. This is the height of the organized crime movement in the United States. There's a lot of gun violence as a result of that. And so different states and the federal government moved to restrict the ownership of certain types of weapons really for the first time. So in this case, we have two defendants, Jack Miller and Frank Lawton. They're both prosecuted for transporting a 12-gauge shotgun shotgun 
with a barrel length of less than 18 inches from Oklahoma to Arkansas without registering the weapon. So basically, they took a sawed-off shotgun over state lines. But the two men argued that the National Firearms Act requiring the tax stamp and the registration violated the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court held that the National Firearms Act, which actually placed registration requirements on machine guns, short-barreled weapons, destruction devices, and other, they called them, unique firearms, does not violate the Second Amendment. It reasoned that the weapons that were being regulated, and this is an important distinction, by the National Firearms Act were not reasonably related to maintaining a, quote, well-regulated militia. So they were not protected by the Second Amendment. So all the way still through 1939, the emphasis continues to be on the militia aspect of the Second Amendment rather than the right to bear arms per se. It's kind of a unique case, though, because this is bizarre, but Miller, who was the named plaintiff in the case, had a court-appointed attorney, couldn't pay for the attorney, so the attorney was appointed to him by the court. Well, this guy never shows up for the court hearing before the Supreme Court because he was never paid. Plus... The case technically never had to go forward because Miller, I guess this is ironic, was shot to death before a decision could be given. So there was no one there to argue why they believed the law was unconstitutional. So at the actual Supreme Court hearing in this case, the justices only heard the government side of the story and not the other. Whether that impacted their decision or not, I suppose, is impossible to say. From 1939, we have to jump all the way to 1976, in the case of Barrett versus the United States. Mr. Barrett, a previously convicted felon, was charged with violating the Gun Control Act of 1968 after he purchased a gun that was involved in interstate commerce before reaching the retailer's shelf. An important distinction here is, of course, the gun has to move from state to state in order for the case to fall under federal jurisdiction. Now, Barrett believed that the charge didn't apply to him because he didn't have anything to do with the fact that the gun moved between states before he showed up at his local federally licensed gun dealer and purchased it. In this case, the Supreme Court once again upholds gun control laws. The Supreme Court of the United States said that the section of the Gun Control Act barring felons from receiving any gun through interstate commerce applies to any firearm that has ever moved in interstate commerce, regardless as to whether or not that was before the felon purchased it. Coming to this decision, the court referenced that the Gun Control Act was meant to, quote, keep firearms away from persons Congress classified as potentially irresponsible and dangerous, end quote. Essentially, what we have going on here is the Supreme Court is looking at the intent of the act. At the end of the day, Barrett was a convicted felon, and therefore the purchase of the firearm was illegal. The court is rejecting Barrett's request to essentially build a loophole into the act. The loophole being that so long as you can find a weapon that has never traveled through interstate commerce, you can purchase it even if you are a convicted felon, which would be expressly against the language of the act. The Supreme Court rejected this argument out of hand. There was no loophole, and Barrett, because he was a convicted felon, was banned from purchasing a firearm. United States versus Lopez all the way in 1995. Again, you can kind of see how rarely these decisions come up. 
just shocking given the amount of discussion over the topic today. So 1995, Alfonso Lopez Jr. was convicted of violating the Gun-Free Zones Act of 1990 after he brought a revolver, which was not loaded, and cartridges to his Texas high school. Lopez, through his attorneys, argued that regulating or banning guns in local schools was well outside the power of Congress under the Commerce Clause and was unconstitutional because schools are local and state entities and have nothing to do with the federal government. The federal government argued that bringing a gun to the school would cause more violence and crime, which would lead to economic problems. So that's why it's under the Commerce Clause, by the way, because the argument being that if there's guns in schools, then that's going to have a sort of tangential side effect overall on the economy. This case is actually a major Commerce Clause case. It's rarely in the list of Second Amendment cases, but it's important because the Supreme Court for the first time struck down a gun control law. The court ruled that the Gun-Free Zone Schools Act of 1990 was unconstitutional, further limiting how the federal government could or regulate gun rights. In other words, the court said you can't just pass whatever regulation you want to, claim it has to do with the economy, and bootstrap it in. It's not going to happen. There has to be an actual direct impact on the economy in order for it to work. So at this point, I think there's a pretty clear line of demarcation between the cases that take place prior to 1940 and those that take place after. Prior to 1940, the emphasis is almost entirely on the militia aspect of the Second Amendment. After 1940, that's going to change dramatically, as we already see in some of the rulings that start to strike down efforts to regulate firearms. And the big change comes in 2008. The case of District of Columbia versus Heller is the case that really transforms how the Second Amendment was understood prior to that time period and how our modern understanding has functioned. I think that's fascinating because you have 200 years of American history, almost, where the Second Amendment is viewed through the lens of the militia. And then in 2008, that just dramatically changes. In the case, there's special policeman Dick Heller. He and several other residents of the District of Columbia all wanted to buy a gun for self-defense. That was his stated purpose, and there's nothing, I've gone through the record, there's nothing in the record that suggests anything otherwise. But at the time, the District of Columbia prohibited the carrying of any unregistered firearms, and it barred all handgun registration. So basically, you couldn't own a handgun in the District of Columbia because you can't carry an unregistered firearm, and they wouldn't register any firearms. The District of Columbia also required all lawfully owned guns, those registered previously, to be kept unloaded and disassembled, or bound by a trigger lock, including in a person's own home, with very, very few exceptions. Heller's argument had nothing to do with the militia aspect of the Second Amendment. Instead, his argument is grounded in the idea that this ban prevents you from properly defending yourself at home and therefore violates the Second Amendment. This is the big change case, because in this Second Amendment case, the Supreme Court made a number of rulings that really changed the way we look at our rights to keep and bear arms. The court found that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to own firearms for the purpose of self-defense. And here's the critical point, unrelated to militia or military activity. And because 
Handguns are today's primary defensive weapon of choice. They are protected. The Supreme Court in 2008 also, for the first time, so it's been, what, almost 250 years, and for the first time, the Supreme Court is going to define what bare arms means. The Supreme Court says bare arms means, quote, to wear, bear, or carry upon the person or in the clothing or in a pocket for the purpose of being armed and ready for, this is interesting, offensive or defensive action in a case of conflict with another person. It also found that a well-regulated militia is not the state's military forces. And therefore, the District of Columbia's regulation effectively banning handgun possession and the law requiring firearms in the home to be kept inoperable at all times violates the Second Amendment. So it's important to understand that the court here went almost beyond the argument that Heller was making, because Heller's argument was primarily to be able to defend himself in his home. The Supreme Court finds that, yes, you have a right to do that. And we're going to say more. You have a right to defend yourself no matter where you are, offensively or defensively. And it has nothing to do with the militia. So this is a huge break from the way that the Second Amendment was interpreted both at the time that the nation was created and was interpreted over the time period. The Second Amendment, though, it says, is not unlimited or absolute. So the Supreme Court kind of pumps the brakes at the last second. Reasonable restrictions may be upheld, such as limits on firearm possession, carrying in schools and government buildings, and hearkening back to the sawed-off shotgun case, quote, dangerous and unusual weapons. Unfortunately, the District of Columbia is not a state. And it's under the exclusive jurisdiction of Congress and the federal government. So while the Supreme Court here makes all these rulings expanding gun rights under the Second Amendment, the case absolutely did not address whether the states could regulate or ban firearms because the District of Columbia, in a very unique circumstance, is not a state. That matter comes to a head pretty quickly. In the aforementioned McDonald versus the city of Chicago case from 2010, Otis McDonald, who's a 76 year old man from Chicago, he wanted to get a handgun for self defense, but he wasn't able to get one because of local law. A city ordinance required all handguns to be registered, but just like the District of Columbia, Chicago refused to register all handgun registrations after a 1982 citywide ban. McDonald argued essentially that the Heller case applies to the states as well as the federal government and that his ban was unconstitutional. The city of Chicago, on the other hand, argued that states should be able to regulate firearms based on local conditions. And this is the watershed case, because in this case, the Supreme Court will hold that the Second Amendment protections apply at the state level via the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court then kind of went on and just repeated everything it already said two years previously in Heller. The constitutional right to bear arms, prohibit state from enacting bans on handguns for self-defense or in the home. And therefore, this is the case that overturns Second Amendment rulings from Cruikshank and Presser, some of the first cases that we talked about. So now, suddenly, absent of very few exceptions, states do not have the power to regulate the possession of firearms. So this is a huge change from the way that the Second Amendment came into being during the constitutional process in 
and the way that it's interpreted almost 250 years later. At the time, state militias were considered essential, not only to defend against tyranny at home, but also to act as quasi-police forces. And, of course, critically, to make sure that only certain people have the right to keep and bear arms. By 2010, those ideas have been completely dismissed. And instead, what we have is a much more expansive view of the amendment that's grounded in the idea that everyone has the right to defend themselves in whatever way, with a few caveats, they so choose. Now, another critical side of this story is, of course, the transformation and the rise of the National Rifle Association, or NRA. The National Rifle Association was founded in 1871 by a group of former Union Army officers, so the North and the Civil War. They were frustrated because so many Northern soldiers were poorly trained and could barely even use the weapons that they have which, of course, belies the argument that everybody had a gun in the 19th century. The original call for the organization of a group comes from Colonel William C. Church in August 1871 in an issue of the Army and Navy Journal. In it, he actually cites the success of Great Britain's own National Rifle Association. And it's confusedly named, at least to modern tennis fans, uh, Wimbledon Rifle Retournament Range. The colonel wrote, quote, an association should be organized in this city, he meant New York, to promote and encourage rifle shooting on a scientific basis. The National Guard is today too slow in getting about this reform. Private enterprise must take up the matter and push it into life. The subject has already been presented to several enterprising officers and ex-officers of the National Guard, and they have been found enthusiastic in the matter. It only requires hearty cooperation, and an actual start to make the enterprise successful, end quote. The group then quickly set about addressing the problem of producing better American marksmen, holding their own British-like shooting tournament in 1873. In 1940, Time magazine would report, 67 years ago, when the National Rifle Association held its first tournament, sportsmen ran the show. By now, there are more civilian rifle clubs in the United States than golf clubs. The NRA, up until the 1970s, did not oppose many restrictions on gun ownership. In fact, as a result of the organized crime lawlessness during the Prohibition era, in the 1920s, the NRA lobbied state governments to pass restrictions on the ability to carry a concealed weapon. And as a result, many states did pass such laws. In 1934, the NRA was on board and helped to draft the National Firearms Act, which proved to be important in the Supreme Court situation. I have never believed in the general practice of carrying weapons. NRA President Carl Frederick told Congress, I do not believe in the general promiscuous toting of guns. I think it should be sharply restricted and only under license, end quote. In 1967, the NRA came out in strong support of California's Mulford Act, which banned the open carrying of firearms. This is actually the law that was passed after armed Black Panthers began patrolling to guard against police brutality. Two dozen said Black Panthers carrying weapons, entered the state capitol in May, as lawmakers considered the legislation, before being disarmed by the state police. Again, it's interesting to consider the question of how the Second Amendment came into being when initially it had to do with who could own guns. And at least through the 1960s, the NRA is on the same page. But in 1968, the NRA for the first time prevented major gun control legislation. Congress imposed new restrictions on gun sales with the Gun Control Act, following the assassinations of President Kennedy and his brother, Robert Kennedy, not to mention civil rights activist 
Martin Luther King Jr. The new law limited mail order gun purchases, required all weapons to carry serial numbers, and restricted felons, those who abused drugs, and those who were mentally ill from buying weapons. The NRA opposed it at the time, though it was able to get through. However, provisions did not include a lot because of NRA lobbying efforts, was a national gun registry, or licenses for all gun carriers. President Lyndon B. Johnson called the NRA, quote, a powerful lobby, a gun lobby, though, to be fair to the NRA, it didn't actually have a lobbying wing until three years later in 1971. Now, everything changed in 1977. In 1977, a hardliner named Harlan Carter ran up against older members of the NRA who tried to curtail his power, but he organized a takeover at the NRA's annual convention in 1977 and became the group's executive vice president. Another hardliner, Neil Knox, took over the Institute for Legislative Action. Suddenly, like flipping a switch, the NRA opposed all types of gun control. Carter famously said, quote, You don't stop crime by attacking guns. You stop crime by stopping criminals. The NRA then saw years of lobbying succeed with the passage of the Firearms Owners Protection Act. It rolled back restrictions on buying, selling, and transporting weapons across state lines, all of which were included in the 1968 Gun Control Act. To pull off the passage of the legislation, the NRA donated $1.4 million to candidates for Congress during the 1984 elections, and that number has not slowed down. So unfortunately, I'm not here today to arbitrate the dispute over what to do with guns in the United States. But I think it's important to understand the history of the Second Amendment, the Bill of Rights, and how everything worked out over time. As always, if you're interested in more content, check out the website, westerncivpodcast.com. You can try a seven-day free trial of Western Civ 2.0. I get another crack at Alexander the Great. It's going to be fun. Links in the show notes. Or if you're interested in having ad-free versions of the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Western Civ Podcast.